There's another conglomeration of severed fingers in the last room, coating the room's interior like the innards of an exploded elephant. Parts of the sprawl are feeling their way, like mold, into a medical cabinet, and the rest is splayed over a fetal shape on a medical gurney. The mass reacts sharply to the new light as Wheeler opens the door, rearing up and angling parts of itself towards him. Wheeler reels backwards and pulls the door to just in time. There is a heavy, fleshy thump as the mass hits the door from the far side. The door holds. Wheeler trips on his own foot and slumps against the far wall. The shape on the gurney was a coiled up human. Not a corpse, but a living human with one wide open eye whose whole body was slowly being consumed and processed into more fingers. They were growing out of his throat. Wheeler didn't see this. He thinks he saw it, but he knows he couldn't have. And that's it. Wheeler casts around the corridor. Every other door he's tried is blocked or locked. The place is below ground, so no windows. No navigable ventilation. There are two more gunshots up at the far end of the corridor, ears splitting in the enclosed space and echoing for many seconds. Hutchinson rounds the corner at a dead run, gun in hand, and reaches him quickly. Find a way out? She asks, pointlessly. She can read Wheeler's expression. He's found nothing good. The place is infested, Wheeler says. Every room, all the stairwells. This is absurd. At the far end of the corridor, the main mass heaves itself around the corner. From this distance, it looks like an ambulatory eight-ton pile of moldy mashed potato and fat, wiggling maggots. There are toes in there as well as fingers, and small teeth, and bits of bone. It has twenty bullet holes in it, and blood is flowing from all of them. But if it has vital organs, they must be elsewhere in the building, because none of the wounds have slowed it down, or otherwise altered its slow, methodical homing behavior. It smells powerfully and creatively disgusting, like concentrated medical waste. It lurches forward in intermittent phases, coating the walls and floor with scarlet ooze as it moves. It'll be on them in about half a minute, squashing them against the end of the corridor and then pulling them into the mess to be remade. I think we're done, Wheeler quavers. Thanks for trying. Hutchinson, for her part, just stands there, gun lowered, watching the thing come. It moves slowly, like a steamroller. It fills the corridor almost to the ceiling. She has two bullets left, and she's considering where to spend them. Shooting the mass itself is like shooting pudding. She'd kill for a grenade. Even a fire axe would be something. She might not be able to stop the thing, but at least she can make herself known with a fire axe. She can make it feel some regret. There are worse fates, I guess. Wheeler goes on, finding himself unable to stop talking, then being digitized by that thing, but not all that many. Hutchinson glances in his direction, apparently paying him direct attention for the first time since they met, sixty crowded minutes ago. She says, riser cupboard. What? She pushes Wheeler aside. There's a white painted wall behind him. There's a lock in it, and a long vertical seam. She spends a moment choosing the right part of the lock to shoot and shoots it out. Behind the tall, wide panel which opens is a shallow, dusty metal edge space, like an elevator shaft with no elevator, allowing filthy pipes and cables to pass vertically between floors. She looks up. There's just enough room to admit a person. Can you climb? She asks Wheeler. Without waiting for a response, she sheds her suit jacket, sticks a flashlight between her teeth, and holds herself up into the darkness. After a brief moment of scuffling, there's another gunshot the other riser covered door. No, Wheeler finally manages. No, I can't climb. The mass is almost on him. He's transfixed by its motion, its all too familiar grasping behavior. I figured, Hutchinson calls down. A hand descends, a human one, with the conventional number of fingers. It's clear up here. Come on, I'm braced. Mine is lip here, it's metal. Come on. Wheeler keeps his own jacket on and buttoned. It's the only part of the situation over which he still has firm control. He has to jump to catch hold of Hutchinson's hand, and just as he jumps, the main mass lunges for him, crossing the last few meters in a rush and catching hold of him by one foot. He sees himself die. 
His sweating hand immediately starts to slip out of Hutchinson's. She braces her other arm and holds him up 15 or 30 centimeters with an angry grunt, then releases his hand for a split second and reaches down like a flash to take a firmer hold of his wrist. She keeps pulling. The mask closes around Wheeler's foot like an aggressive, proactive quicksand. He yelps and kicks at it with his other foot until it finally pries his shoe loose. The mask retreats for a second, taking a crucial moment to realize that its prize is not living flesh. But by that time, Hutchinson has hauled Wheeler up another half meter, and Wheeler has started pushing herself upwards off the pipework with his feet. The mask lunges again, but falls short and seems too unintelligent to climb after them. It sloshes around, probing its surroundings, perplexed by the shoe. Hutchinson hauls Wheeler over the lip into the next corridor. He scrapes his ribs badly and arrives crawling, eyes watering. He doesn't die. He can still see himself dying. He stays on all fours for a significant amount of time, processing what just happened. F Hutchinson is already standing and apparently not even significantly exerted. We need to get to the roof. I might be able to get a signal out from there. You're at the gym pretty often. Wheeler pants, sitting back. You train for a fresh hell like this? Yeah. That's great, Wheeler says, because I play the violin. It's not quite as physically demanding. As careers go, I mean. When you said you were a county health inspector, that was an enormous lie, wasn't it? Hutchinson ignores the question, out of habit, and waits impassively for the man to cool. This is asinine. Wheeler declares, this is brain damage. His skin crawls and grotesque visions flood through his brain. Eventually, he recovers his breath and gets to his feet. He stands lopsided, so he takes his other shoe off and throws it back down the riser for symmetry. We need to get to the roof, Hutchinson says again. Wheeler blinks a long blink, then focuses on something around the corner, something on the wall, which Hutchinson can't see from where she's standing. Yeah, one second. He goes to it, it's a red panel, and pulls something down. Here, you're having no luck with the gun. Try this. It's a fire axe. He stepped on a rusty nail backstage after the show and came to the emergency room for a tetanus injection. While waiting, he slowly realized that more than half of the people waiting with him were clutching partially or entirely severed fingers. Bandsaw accidents, hands caught in car doors, hands trapped in door hinges, hands crushed in machinery, every one of them unrelated. There was an epidemic of physical injury, which should have been impossible, and when he tried to bring it up with the medical staff, they didn't seem to understand what he was saying. And then, he saw one of the fingers escape. He followed it as it wriggled away down a long corridor to a far corner of the hospital, to an ajar door, which nobody in the hospital seemed to be able to perceive except for him, and into a different building, where there were no people at all, just hundreds and hundreds of wriggling, exploring, slowly reproducing and lengthening fingers. He slammed the door and tried and failed to get someone, anyone, staff or patient, to see what he was seeing. He found a payphone and dialed for emergency services and ordered off the menu, asking for emergency, industrial scale control or hazardous containment or psychic support or something. And there was a long pause, and he was connected to what was either a very measured, dispassionate human or an impressively articulate robot operator. It told him to wait by the phone, an associate would be with him shortly. Marion Hutchinson arrived in person, slightly less than 15 minutes later. He showed her the door. They went a few paces inside, Hutchinson crouching and aiming some kind of flashlight scanner at the finger worms. Behind them, something reached out and gently pushed the door closed with a click. They turned and saw what it was and ran. Hutchinson hacks her way through the last of the flesh clogged stairwell. They're almost at the roof. This part of the disturbed infestation doesn't seem to be mobile, although it is freakishly grabby. Wheeler stands three paces back from her, partly to avoid the backswing, but mostly so he doesn't have to watch. It's butchery and it's grisly and Hutchinson barely seems perturbed by it. She slices methodically until there are waterfalls of gore coming down the stairs and soaking her shoes and his socks 
and she does it with the manner of someone trimming a hedgerow. Crunch, crunch. Wheeler is shivering and starting to crash. If he doesn't stay right in the middle of the stairwell, the remaining fingers tug at his hair and sleeves. In another few minutes, it may finally dawn on him that this is really happening. This is crazy. This is nuts, he says to himself over and over. What was that word he used back there? Hutchinson asks suddenly. Hmm? Crunch. Don't tune out. When the mass was coming down the hall, did you say digitized? Um, Wheeler seems to change gear and wake up. Yeah, uh, but in the old sense of the word. Digit meaning finger, so digitized meaning turned into fingers. I just got it. She's smiling. He can tell from the sound of her words. Chlunk. That's great. It is? What kind of violin music? Uh, what kind would you like? Tonight's, last night's, Christ, yesterday's concert was Prokofiev's Violin Concerto No. 1. And a few other pieces, of course, but that was the main course for me. That's where I got my teeth in. Hutchinson stops hacking and turns around. She actually looks him in the eye. That piece is a nightmare. It's a challenge, Wheeler admits brightly. No, I mean it's chaotic. It's unlistenable. I can play anything you like, Wheeler states. Hutchinson appears to spend a moment considering this possibility. Bach. You can play some Bach? Just get me to a violin. Hutchinson thinks for a moment longer. She smiles and nods, and goes back to hacking. And they hit the roof, and Hutchinson's radio finally works, and she calls everything in. She speaks in rapid keywords, which Wheeler can't quite follow, although he can pick out his own name, and hazmat and a repeated word which sounds to him like a brand of cassette tape. Memetics. It's very nearly dawn. This wing of the hospital is a few stories shorter than its main body, so rows of bright lit wards look down over the roof, while the roof looks out over two sprawling car parks, and then greenery and roads, and faint, dull red, where the sun is due to come up. Hutchinson quickly ascertains that there is no fire escape from here. The intended fire exit from the roof is the stairwell, up which they just came, so they'll have to wait for a helicopter, or more likely, and less romantically, a long ladder. Backup is coming, Hutchinson concludes. They have to come in from the next city over, so it could be a few hours. They'll have decontamination gear, antibiotics, blankets, tedious debriefing forms, you name it. But most importantly, coffee. Wheeler makes an inarticulate sound the sound of one who could use the coffee, and after that, a drink. God, I have another concert today, he says. He sits on the thick perimeter wall, rubs his eyes, rubs his sore feet, and begins to shut down. You'll be there, Hutchinson says. The nasty part is over. She did well for civilian. I've seen far worse. Worse than this? Hutchinson says nothing. I'm sorry. Wheeler opens his eyes again. He gestures at the mayhem from which they just escaped, the fire door, and everything it leads to. It's all still down there. You've seen worse than this? Hutchinson again says nothing. What is this? What happened here? At first, Hutchinson doesn't answer this either. She walks away across the roof and spends an entire minute staring at the forthcoming sun. And then, surprising Wheeler and slightly surprising even herself, she walks back to him and says, SCP-4051, which is the number we just assigned to this infestation, has an intrinsic property which makes it nearly impossible for sapient organisms to perceive it. It's a form of camouflage. It's not invisible. It's a mental blocking effect. Information about it goes nowhere. It gets suppressed. People walk past this building every day of the week. They don't see what's blocking the windows. They walk past the door and don't realize it's standing open. It could have been here for decades. The researchers will get the whole story eventually. Wheeler finds in this explanation something he halfway understands. So, living Fnords? And this actually slows Hutchinson down for a second. She gets that reference. She read those books when she was younger, years ago, before joining the Foundation. But she's never made the connection between Fnords and the work she does. For as long as she's been working there, she hasn't even thought about it. The irony is intense enough to burn. 
Yeah, she says. Except that you can see them, Wheeler says. I have specialist training, Hutchinson says. Declined to mention her drug regimen. And I, also, can see them? You seem to have a mild natural immunity to memory clouding phenomena, Hutchinson explains. It's rare, but it happens. At a hospital this busy, someone like you was bound to stumble into this place sooner or later. And escape alive, she privately adds. But the point is, this infestation, SCP-4051, is a snowflake. I don't mean that it's special and unique, I mean it's part of a blizzard. I work for an independent scientific research institution with a specialist focus on the containment of hazardous anomalous phenomena. We have an international mandate and formidable resources and unimaginable responsibilities. We… we watch the blizzard and we guard the little fire. We're called the Foundation. Wheeler's full attention is on her now. He feels tense and exposed here, vulnerable to extraordinary natural forces from which, by rights, he should be fleeing. But he's also fascinated. Hutchinson has a faintly ethereal attitude to her. It's as if she's not standing on the same planet as everybody else. So you're not FBI, he says. Either, I mean. That was my other guess. Hutchinson wrinkles her nose. I hate that show. I don't believe I mentioned a show, Wheeler says mischievously. They do everything wrong, Hutchinson says. A nerve has been touched. She shuffles irately. They don't have enough people. They don't trust each other. They don't spend nearly enough time on paperwork. Paperwork saves lives. But most of all, I hate the will they or won't they. For what, five years? It's forced, it's farcical. She glares at Wheeler. It doesn't take that long to know. You will or you won't. And then you do. Wheeler reads her expression carefully. You do? Yeah, Hutchinson says, smiling again. Yeah, I think you do. A distant, rapid thudding noise slowly becomes apparent. Hutchinson sees the source of the sound first and points. Backup's here, and it looks like we raided a helicopter after all. End of file. To learn more about the SCP Foundation, subscribe to SCP Orientation Today and turn the notification bell on so you don't miss any of our videos.